very important. That's like signing the law. If you don't be careful of your attitude, your attitude will block your altitude. Of true 
you worship is flesh. I don't feel like I worship that's because it's the flesh. Worship, listen, worship is not performance. Because that brings pride to those performing. It's not about that. No. No. It could be preachers, it could be singers, it could be lay persons, it could be people serving, communion. It is not performed for the sake of the performers or the participants. It's an offering to God. It must be done in that which is hidden, the spirit. Your heart's got to be right. My heart, my heart, I'm just angry. Well then, let's get the heart right. Before we talk about worship, it's because you don't know God. God is not a person that he can lie. And you can be taken out. The opposite of truth is a lie. Falsehood. Listen carefully. So, worship must be genuine. It has to reflect who God is and your reverence for him. It's time out, church, for playing. This whole year, the Lord has shown me that we should be focused on revitalization through discipleship. And, yet, and look, once God gives me a program, I don't ask for permission. Come on now. Because he's the boss. Just go forward with it. Everybody who's on board will be on board. Everybody who knows will get off. Doesn't matter who you are. Because ultimately, the only star of this program is Jesus Christ. True worship and saving faith no longer are mediated through types of required physical aids. You know, you don't have to go to a large edifice. You can worship in a little one room shack. Now that Christ has come to bring full and free salvation, we don't even have to worry about being saved. You got to do something about it, but you don't have to worry about it. You're saved by grace through faith. I was young when I was saved, but maybe you weren't saved. Maybe you were just churched. The truth in Christ received through the Spirit by faith is the worship, is the worship, is the worship the Father really seeks. He's not looking for anything else from us. How could the omniscient God ever have to seek anything? I mean, he knows everything, right? Yet, the Lord affirmed that he does. That's what it says. Christ said that he himself had come to seek and save the lost. So, so they're seeking. They're looking for those who are going to stand firm on the truth. Amen. Amen. In some inscrutable way, bound up in the hum humanly in impenetrable balance between divine election and human responsibility, it satisfies the infinite heart of God when we approach that. When we respond to his sacrificial love and gratitude and worship. It's, it's, a, it's a shame when you see people take things for granted. If, 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 if you're married and you present a gift to your spouse and the spouse receives it as if they were deserving it, you got a problem. You got a serious problem. That's why certain marriages don't last because one of the, the other one's looking for a ride. You have to do things based on your vertical relationship with God because true worship reflects that vertical relationship, truth and spirit. I'm just about done. God is spirit. God is what? Spirit. God is spirit. That means he's not physical, not material. So, so he exists on a different plane from us. He's not subject to the limitations of physical bodies. Gravity doesn't have an impact on God. 
Hear me well. God is deeply personal. God, God, God can be worshipped only at the most intensely personal level. Amen. Spirit and truth. That means that you abandon everything. Amen. I come before God, I don't have any business thinking about anything but worship. Anything. I, I should be thanking Him. I should be praising Him. I should enter into His gates with thanksgiving. I should enter into His courts with praise. It should be so genuine that I church, new this, new that, because they, they, they don't have the intense worship that God requires, and you can't have that without the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, then everything that happens outside of you stays outside. God is deeply personal. God is deeply personal. God is deeply personal. You have to worship him on an intense personal level. Lord, I love you because God has already said, I love you. From our spirit to God's spirit. Worship is not offered to a physical object or in a mechanical way. We just come in and we know we're going to sing the same song every, every uh, Sunday on in a particular month. So we come in and we sing those songs and we know that we're going to get up and we're going to do a dance and then we know that we're going to come, we're going to do an offering, then the choir's going to sing, then we're going to hear a message and then we're going home. Wrong program. Amen. Amen. Wrong program. No. Yes, those things are in place that they might give you some structure, but your heart got to be able to operate in a more way is seeking God in that structure. Yeah. So true worship of God must be in a personal, intensely personal relationship. It needs to be more intense than any other relationship you have. Anybody want to ask me any questions before I take my seat?
heaven and earth are yours. Angels bow. What a mighty God that we serve. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you right now. You. You're such a mighty God. We ask that you would enter now, Lord Jesus. I mean that. Preach a word in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Give me an honor to the Spirit of Christ. Our pastor, our bishop, Dr. Sherwin Lance II, and all of you, my heavenly father's children. You know, it's just a blessing to be here once again. Salvation. Come on, somebody said get some. Yes, sir. Here is what happens to some. 
some believers, Paul and Silas, who was in prison. Acts 16, 23, and some says, when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jail to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Listen, say, that's the way the enemy tries to play on, on us. Amen. He'll turn you that way. He'll twist you that way. He'll back and forth. He'll stop on you. said about Paul and Silas. Mm -hmm. Acts 16, 25, and some say, but about midnight, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying yeah. and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, yes, sir. so that the foundation of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone changed world unfastened. Mm -hmm. Because of Paul and Silas' beliefs, they were free. Mm -hmm. I believe they had accepted Jesus at that time yeah. Yeah. as their Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. So salvation is free to the believer. Uh -huh. It is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit. Spirit through conviction of sin to which the sinner responds to repentance to what God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to give up something. Amen. Come on now. Like your old lifestyle? You got to give that up. Come on now. Then you got to be in repentance. Yes, yes. Repentance and faith are inseparable experiences of grace. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin toward God. And faith is acceptance of Jesus, Christ, and commitment of the entire personality to Him as Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 You got to want this, saints. You got to want this change. Justification is God's gracious and full of faith upon principles of his righteousness of all sinners who repent and believe in Christ. Something that we don't deserve. But God gives to us anyhow. Justification. Justification brings the believer unto a relationship of peace and favor with God. Justification is what Jesus gave us as though it never happened. Amen. Right. Then there's sanctification. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sanctification is the experience beginning in regeneration by which the believer is set apart to God's purpose and is enabled to progress toward moral and spiritual and power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Amen. 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 Somebody, you better get some. <laughs> then there's glorification. Glorification is a combination of salvation and it's a final blessing abiding state of the redeemed. Yes, salvation is free, but it's not cheap. We got to be regenerated. Because it is a work of God's grace whereby believers become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Acts 2, 3 said, 2 and 38 said, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Come on now. Now, one of the Bible's greatest truths is that God offers us our salvation as a free gift. It isn't something we can buy. Yes. No, it is something we can earn Amen. by our own good works. The Bible puts it this way, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is 
eternal life. Romans 6, 23. As believers, we must know that God's gift of salvation to us is free. But it costs God the life of his son. That's right. Man. That's right. The reason is because on the cross, Jesus Christ became the final sacrifice for our sins. He paid for our salvation with his blood. But remember, God's gift of salvation doesn't become ours until we accept it. Amen. Listen, saints. Just as we can accept or refuse gifts from someone else, you can refuse this gift from God. Amen. God gifts. But why? Why would you? Don't let this happen to you. But by faith, reach out and accept Christ into your life today. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. In my conclusion here, everybody likes free stuff. It is good. But accepting Jesus Christ, it is good stuff. Don't get any better than that. Romans 10 9 tells us that. And if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Go to the scene in verse 10. For with the heart, with the heart, a person believed, resulted in righteousness. And with the mouth,
Edwards. How many of you are grateful this morning?
but I need to give you this. Uh, thank you. Go to, because uh, we'll be free the other, the other had something to do Now this is going to be pretty good. Uh, second key. That's in the Old Testament. Second key. Because you keep looking for 
for stuff. You keep wanting stuff. You keep searching for stuff. Don't you know the hole that you want to fill can only be filled by heaven because you're looking outside of you. You keep trying to fix something that's a fantasy in your mind. You keep looking for something, searching for something. Look, if God don't move, you don't move. If you're on your job, if God don't move, you don't move. She's obviously content. But what can we do for her? Get outside the servant said. Well, she has no son. And her husband is old. Then Elijah said, call her. So he called her. And she stood in the doorway in front of the man of God, the word of God. And about this time next year, he told her, you will hold your son in your arms. Now get this. She loved the word because that's why she made room for the word. But she had not had anybody say this kind of thing to her before. So it startled her. She said, no, my Lord. She objected. Don't mislead me. Don't get my hopes up. Don't, don't, don't make me think something's going to happen and, and then when it doesn't happen, I'm going to be defeated. No, Lord, please. Don't do that, my Lord. Don't mislead your servant, oh man of God. You don't find where Elisha responded to that. Because he understood that he was dealing with a person who had never been exposed at that level. Amen. But the next verse says, but the woman became pregnant. So if God says it, that settles it. Shut Come on, up and trust him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the next moment, the woman became pregnant. Now the moment could have been a month, could have been, I don't know how long it was. It just said, but the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son. Just as the man of God had told her. Now, this is all good in here. And we can stay here as we prepare to lift up this prayer. But you need to know that it gets deeper than this. Yes. Look, look, look. Uh, the child grew. And one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. And it was hot. The sun was shining. And he, and he had a sunstroke. My head, my, my head, he said to his father. And his father, I'm reading right here in, in, the, in the 19th verse. His father servant, carry him to his mama. Uh -huh. Because after all, it was his mama that was given the promise. Uh -huh. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mama, the boy sat on her lap until noon and then he died. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness! Here the gift that God has given me is now gone. Look, the enemy wants to deceive you. The enemy wants to accuse you. The enemy wants to tempt you into believing that God She went up, laid him on the bed of the man of God. She didn't just go put him in his room. No, she wanted him to be in a place that was anointed, sanctified place, place set aside for just the word. Then she shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, give me a wagon and had a drive. I got to go somewhere. Well, why are you going to him today? The husband said, which is a legitimate question for the husband to ask his wife. I mean, why, why are you? What, what, what's up? It, it's not the new moon. I mean, we're not celebrating anything. It's not the Sabbath. So, so why are you going? She said, it's all right. See, so she believed God. Get this. They sat on the donkey and got on the little cart. And then she told the, the, the servant, now go, 
And don't slow down and don't stop unless I tell you to. So she set out and came to the man of God, the word of God, at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, Look, there's the there's a Shulamite. Run to her and ask her, is everything all right? I mean, are you cool? What's going on? Is your child all right? When she went, when, 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 when the servant got there, she said, everything's all right. In other words, I, I appreciate you coming out here, but I need to really see the word of God. Sometimes we take substitutes and we, we like good feeling. So in the church service, you'll, you'll settle for good feeling when what you really needed was a stronger faith relationship with the word of God. So she said, look, no offense, but everything's all right. I got to see, I got to see the preacher. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Other she, she humbled herself. Some of us are so arrogant, so prideful, you can't humble yourself. And look, she humbled herself. She took hold of his feet. She could say, well, he's just a man. He, he breathes just like I do. He bleeds just like I do. So why? No, 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 no. She understood that this man was carrying the word of God. She, she took hold of his feet. Now listen carefully. Yehazai came over to push her away. But the man of God understood and he said, leave her alone. She is in a bitter distress. She's hurting. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Then she said, well, man of God, did I ask you for a son? Man of God, did I tell you, don't raise my hopes? And Elijah said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak and put it in your dress. Take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anybody, don't, don't spend time talking to them. I don't want you stopping for no coffee and stuff. On, Get on down the road and go, go to this woman's house. On, and lay man. my staff on the Come boy's on, face. Come on now. But the mother, who understood the power of the word of God, she said, surely, as the Lord lives, and as you live, I'm not leaving you. Man of God, I'm not, I'm not leaving. I thank you for sending your servant, but, but I need you because you represent the word of God. Your servant don't represent the word of God. Your servant represents you, but you represent the word of God. So he got up and followed her. Yeah, as I was going ahead, of course, he laid the staff on the boy's face and the boy, the boy did not respond. So he went back and met Elias and the woman told him, said, look, the boy did not, did not get up. He was, he was not awakened. So when Elijah reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch, on Elijah's bed. He went in, shut the door on the two of them. You got to sometimes keep certain people out. Because they bring in spirits of doubt. You don't need spirits of doubt when you're trying to make contact. He, he went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed, laid up on the boy, touching him mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched, I see sometimes when, when the word of God is moving, it looks strange to us. That's because you don't, you don't understand. Look, it was in Isaiah. We, when the Lord says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are, are bigger than your ways. As he stretched himself out upon him, the, body, the boy's body grew warm. Elijah turned away and walked back and forth. But why was he walking back and forth? He was making sure that every, every corner of that room was anointed. Setting up. We, we need to walk around our house. When you get home today, listen, when you get home today, you ought to open the Bible and start to read. Where shall I start to read? Well, you could start right here. Just start reading the word and just walk all through your house, your bathroom, your kitchen, your closets, your bathroom, your garage, whatever you have. You ought to walk through the word through your house reading the word of God. And I talk about really reading it. I don't mean just mourning, but reading it. Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out his stretched out upon the board once more. The boy sneezed. The dead people don't sneeze. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elijah called on his eyes and said, Call his mama. Call the boy's mama. And he did, and when she came, he said, Take your boy 
She fell at his feet again, humbling herself. We don't, we're not humble enough. Amen. We have to learn to humble ourselves. Yes. She fell at his feet again. Look, look, look. We got, we got some anointed preachers here. Uh -huh. Y'all treat them just like they anybody. Amen. And you talk to them any kind of way you want, you better, you better back up. Because the reality is that they carry the word of God. Amen. We should not, you don't, you don't be judging, trying to figure out, God knows what to do with the preacher. God will take care of that. You got to learn to humble yourself before the carrier of the word of God. And he did. And when she came, he said, take your son. And she fell at his feet and bowed yeah. to the ground. Then she took her son and they went out. When, when you're talking about prayer, you better know who you're talking about. Yeah. Humble yourself. You can't receive something if you're too arrogant. 